Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, CLE. I'm Jeff Jarrett. I'll be presenting today. Uh, just to get started, I think I'll uh, start with a poll. Just a second here. I'll just ask what kind of organization uh, are you from that you're joining us with? Hopefully, everyone can see the poll here. like mostly uh, two-thirds law firms, some in-house, and a few consultants, uh, a bit of at least one government uh, agency personnel. Perfect. Okay. Um, well, I'll just jump into the slides here. Uh, first, I guess, any, um, any questions you might have uh, maybe save them for the end, and then you can type them into the box on the side, uh, and I'll address them at the end. That would be great. Um, otherwise, I'll uh, just get started. Any um, audio uh, problems, if you can't hear me through your speakers, um, you can dial in uh, through uh, the phone number, uh, which should be in the, the bottom left-hand side. Okay. Um, well, welcome to today's CLE. Uh, today we'll be covering uh, the e-discovery life cycle. So we're going to start, I'll tell you a bit about who I am um, and who Eva is. We'll talk about the legal framework um, behind electronic discovery. I'll look at the EDRM, electronic discovery reference model. And then we'll talk about each stage in the e-discovery life cycle. So hard copy processing, forensic collection, e-discovery processing, document review software, uh, how to actually present you know, in trial. <clears throat> I, I also have... Um, couple slides on the future of e-discovery, which was added recently. Uh, and then just a, a comment on how uh, generally the marketplace for e-discovery services work. Okay, just a slide on myself. Um, I'm originally from the U.S. and got my start uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office at the Department of Justice. Uh, my old office there, we've recently had our claim to fame. Uh, if you've seen the Wolf of Wall Street, uh, my old boss prosecuted Jordan Belfort there, so um, <clears throat> a little uh, shout out to my old office. Um, I worked for a number of years uh, as a freelance consultant in New York City, uh, helping law firms with their review software, and then I've been at eLaw for the last six years, uh, uh, generally working with our review software um, and some of our e-discovery systems kind of with our clients. Who is eLaw? Um, eLaw is uh, 15 years old. Um, we got our start in the uh, Royal Commission space, so really uh, providing services to Royal Commissions, uh, evidence preparation, and uh, uh, displaying um, documents in court. Um, then we kind of moved back across the litigation lifecycle, uh, back into you know, all the hard copy and the forensic collections, the electronic discovery, and uh, one of our products review software relativity, that, that hosting kind of work. We've been offering relativity as a hosting solution for about four years. We have offices in the major capital cities in Australia. Okay, um, well, so why are we talking about electron discovery at all? Uh, there's a legal framework in place in Australia where uh, basically um, in uh, 2009, um, the Chief Justice uh, well, put out a practice note, um, Case Management 6, CM6, as it's commonly referred to. And in CM6, it basically uh, gives us a guideline that e-discovery should be used uh, in a matter whenever there's a significant number of documents. Um, the threshold 200 documents is mentioned. Uh, also, 5,000 documents is mentioned. Ultimately, it's up to uh, either the parties or the judge, um, but often it is uh, ordered now whenever there's kind of in the thousands of documents. Really, the goal behind this uh, guide was <clears throat> uh, to reduce the cost of uh, litigation, uh, particularly in you know, a firm historically with, with photocopy, you know, everything would be done in paper. All the documents to be photocopied, sent across for discovery. Uh, now with 
yeah. scanning technology and uh, a lot of documents starting in electronic form to begin with, the courts are saying, look, don't print all this out, keep it electronic, review it electronically, exchange it electronically. So we've seen some great guidance from the courts in this state. Now, each state, uh, well, the federal government has practice note CM6, the federal court, and each state um, has its own set of either uh, directives or guidelines. So depending on where the matter is, uh, which court um, <coughs> it, it's involved in, would be which you need to look for which kind of uh, guiding uh, documentation. Now there, definitely the federal court practice note CM6 is uh, the standard in this space, um, but then each of the state, state ones relatively mirror it. Sometimes they don't go into quite as much detail, sometimes they mirror it almost exactly. Uh, most of them are in the last few years. Hello. Uh, South Australia actually has a new one. I need to update this uh, oh, the yeah. last month. Oh, cool. All right. Now, on the back of these uh, practice no notes, problem. practice notes are more general oh, guidelines. What actually needs to happen in a, in a matter where electronic discovery is, has been ordered or is being used is the parties need to agree on the exact uh, rules of exchange uh, in the format of an exchange protocol. If there's probably one thing you learned today from this CLE is the importance of an exchange protocol. So what does it actually list out? It lists out the, the technical rules for exchange, so what formats your documents are supposed to be in, um, additional fields of, of information about documents. So for example, um, the dates of documents. If you want to be able to sort your documents in date order, you need to have the dates filled out in a specific field. So the exchange protocols on, on the back of the practice notes typically say you need to have 10 standard fields when you're exchanging. I'll, I'll go into that detail quite a bit later. Often there's a few subjective fields that are exchanged, um, privilege, confidential. The protocols list out the exact technical formats of the files that are being sent across. As the legal team, you probably don't have to worry about that, that as much, but certainly your um, in-house ALT team um, or your e-discovery provider um, kind of lives and breathes these documents. Um, one of the key reasons that uh, we always insist that you, know, you really need to put an exchange protocol in place is simply to decide what are the three digit party codes to use um, when running a matter. So, you know, if one, typically the, the party codes are the name of the client, the end corporate client, um, but I have had an instance where two firms uh, started using the same letters to start their documents with, and it uh, led to some uh, obviously problems when they exchanged because they were trying to exchange documents that had the same ID. Um, finally, OCR requirements. So I'll, I'll tell you more about what OCR is, but it effectively makes documents searchable. Um, typically, exchange protocol requires documents to be searchable. Um, if you don't have this, then presumably both parties have to go to the expense of making documents searchable when it could be easily exchanged. So a cost reduction. So my really, our, our one piece of advice is always put an exchange protocol in place. Even a proposed draft protocol, um, even if it doesn't get finalized. Uh, is extremely valuable. Um, and our clients who aren't familiar with these yet, we have some templates um, that are really industry standard that, that can be used. Okay. okay, this is the Electronic Discovery Reference Model. This is an international group of e-discovery experts who have um, put this together. Um, the, the, the simple way to explain it is you start in the beginning with uh, lots of uh, volume of documents, mostly irrelevant, then as it goes through the process, uh, the volume is cut down, called down, and then relevance on the right increases. So by the time you get to presentation, which is the court phase, you end up with a lot of, well, all your, a few, a number of documents, but highly relevant. I don't want to spend too much time on this slide because I've rewritten it um, into something I think is a bit clearer. So really what the, the stages here are talking about, and, and we're going to spend time on each box uh, on this slide, 
So you start in this kind of document compliance management, which is pre-litigation, you know, at your corporate clients. Um, you have, you know, are your retention policies in place? Um, are, you know, the backup schedule of some documents need to be kept for three years, some for five years, some for, for seven years, et cetera. It depends on kind of regulation in the industry. Um, I, I put in here information governance. This is something that um, is getting a bit of buzz. What this is, and, and we work with a software provider who, who kind of sells the software. What this can do is um, there's software that will basically actively analyze every email daily that's being sent within an organization. And certain filters are set up. So if certain, say, keywords are used, you know, fraud, risk, um, some kind of keywords, they can be uh, forwarded on to the compliance department automatically kind of at the end of the day. So there's some real like Big Brother style uh, technology being used in the corporate space to, to really prevent litigation catch problems before they become serious problems. Okay, um, the next phase, uh, the second column, collection, <clears throat> we have here is forensic collection. So this is where actually collecting electronic documents, and that can either be done by um, corporate in-house IT departments or by a forensic expert. We'll talk about that more. Um, the bottom part of processing is all those electronic documents <clears throat> we can give kind of snapshots of what's in this, so you know, date ranges, uh, spider communication graphs between uh, the key users at, um, involved in the matter, uh, removing exact duplicates. Talk a lot about that. Up on the, the bureau side, we have all this hard copy. <clears throat> There'll be, you know, it needs to be scanned, uh, the data entry needs to happen, the, the dates need to be pulled off of it, um, and then Finally, it moves into this review stage, which is for uh, software review. This is often the first time the legal team really gets, hand, gets their kind of hands dirty with the document. Uh, and this is where you're marking up documents within the software you know, for uh, relevance, for legal issues, for privilege. You might be building a chronology. Then, based off those coding decisions, uh, the lists are generated and documents are exchanged between the parties in this production disclosure phase. Uh, any redactions are burnt in. And then finally, at the top of this presentation, uh, documents are displayed in court. Now, uh, pretend, uh, potentially, uh, there's also this forensic component. Depending how the collection is performed, sometimes forensic experts have to testify uh, in court um, how they collected documents. We had a case recently um, about uh, a will. A will was in dispute, the kind of registered will uh, with the solicitor was uh, potentially not the final version. Um, the gentleman died and there was more recent versions of his will on his uh, laptop. So our forensic expert um, testified, uh, well analyzed um, the, those documents on his laptop, Word version, was able to figure out when certain changes were made and the dates around that and, was, and introduced that into evidence um, which the judge found very compelling and ruled that you know, those electronic versions were actually um, the, the true uh, last uh, will and testament. Okay, so let's start on each of um, <clears throat> each of the phases of the discovery life cycle. The first is hard copy processing. So clients on a regular basis ring me up, Jeff, I have five boxes. The judges order electronic discovery. What do we do? So we collect those five boxes. Um, we stamp every page, paginate, um, with, there's two ways we do it. We actually either put a physical sticker on the original, if you need to refer back to the original, um, or we scan them and then we put an electronic stamp on the scanned version. Uh, the latter is much more popular. We, we don't really put those stickers on too often anymore. Documents are scanned in, they're turned into PDFs. They're made searchable through OCR. Um, we perform delimiting, so we both we determine where documents begin and end. You may say, oh, that's really easy, right? You just look at the staple. Um, but we actually found that uh, typically, you know, the, the state of paper files from the kind of corporate client site are often a, a big mess when it comes to staples and paper clips. So we kind of remove everything and make an objective analysis on where documents begin and end. Then we replace all the staples um, so that they are restored to their original 
<coughs> state. We also make a determination on hosts and attachments. So, you know, a report and then a three um, annexures are kind of kept together as separate documents, but that relationship is preserved. Finally, we perform objective coding, which is a data entry process, and then load them into a review system such as well. Now, OCR, I mentioned earlier. What is OCR? So when you actually scan a paper document uh, into, this, into a system, uh, at first it's just a picture. Uh, the system, we can't read any letters off of it, it's just a picture. So OCR is a software process that attempts to turn the, the, that picture, to actually read it and identify the letters, the shape of the letters, and turn them into proper characters that can then be searched. Now, if I were to print off this slide, say here, scan it in, and then perform OCR today, we would catch 100% of every word on this page. If this was an older document, it had gone quite grainy, if it had been faxed, we may only get 90% of the letters. So OCR is absolutely not a uh, surefire, um, quote unquote, science. It's, it definitely misses uh, documents on, on certain types. Um, another limitation is handwriting. Uh, I haven't seen any software in this industry that uh, can effectively read handwriting. Um, I had a case where uh, the handwriting was very important. It was a medical case and the notes were really crucial. So we actually transcribed all of the notes um, in a field into text and in human transcription. Um, so then the legal team could review those fields and, and so they could search the text that way. Um, what's the benefit of this? Really, once OCR is run, you have lightning fast content searching. You know, of those six documents, you plug in a word and it's going to, you know, within seconds, pull back every document within that, uh, those five boxes that have that word in there. So really uh, powerful uh, searching is enabled by this technology. Uh, the federal court practice note lists out 10 fields that have to be disclosed for every document. So we have um, uh, obviously the document ID, uh, which is a unique identifier for every document. We have the host reference, so is it an email, is it, is it an attachment? Um, the date of the document, uh, estimated date, which uh, tells if the date is a partial date or not. Uh, the title of the document, what type of document it is, and then the five party fields. So why is this information useful? Well, the, kind of the key example I give is if you want to sort your documents in date order, you have these, the document date field available. As soon as it's in your system, you can literally click one button and everything's sorted in date order. So really, really powerful for helping to organize uh, your documents. Um, this, uh, this, this Objective coding is typically either done internally at a law firm or outsourced to a service bureau such as law. Okay, putting aside the hard copy, let's move into the kind of forensic side, um, the electronic side. And that the first step in the electronic uh, processing step is collection. So how do we actually get our hands on this um, electronic material? You know, with hard copy, it's pretty simple. There's a box paper inside of it. With electronic, you know, documents can be stored in all sorts of different ways. Uh, we have email in a variety of email systems. We have loose electronic files, um, which uh, are sometimes on file servers, sometimes they're on laptops. Uh, now we're even seeing them on mobile devices. So the first kind of questions that need to be asked in a matter is, you know, with typically it's the uh, law firm and uh, their corporate client, and the solicitors really need to start asking these kind of questions. Well, where uh, within the corporate network could all this information be that's relevant to the case? You know, what are the date ranges, where the people we're interested in? Uh, this, this kind of process um, is, is uh, what needs to be done in order to really identify. You know, we, we want to cast the net really wide at this stage in the process. Now, collecting electronic evidence is actually uh, a it's a technical process, and it's quite different than normal kind of IT um, procedures, in part because of the importance of metadata. 
metadata are fields of information about documents. So the most classic example of metadata would probably be on an email, the, the to, the from, the date, those are all metadata fields. On an electronic in a Word file just sitting on my computer, um, the last modified date would be a really key piece of uh, metadata. Now, we see problems um, if, if, if a collection isn't done properly, you need to use the right software and have the right skills, um, certain problems can happen with the data that can be altered. And then further down the chain, we see uh, a lot of problems. So the first one would be um, uh, the inability to deduplicate. So let me just tell you what deduplication is. Um, if I send an email to my colleague um, and then both of our uh, Outlooks get captured for a for a matter. There's going to be two copies of that email in my outbox and in my colleague's inbox. Using deduplication, we can automate. We can identify that those two are identical and remove one. Now, that is probably one of the most value add services that we do is uh, removing uh, those key documents. Uh, sorry, those duplicate documents rather than having the legal team have to review both of them. Now, if we, if the collection hasn't been done properly, the, the metadata, the, the digital fingerprint um, in electronic files, they can be altered, and then we're unable to perform that deduplication process. Uh, the next is email threading. So if I have an email, send it on to my colleague, um, he sends it on to another colleague, there's, you know, with some comments, we can identify that those three uh, emails are all related to each other and, and present them to the, the legal team when they're reviewing them together. If the collection is not done properly, we lose the ability to do that. Um, I had a case once where uh, the end corporate client gave us two folders, emails and attachments. And there was absolutely no way to identify which attachments went with which emails at that point. So that was uh, pretty much a complete disaster, and we had to manually review and take hours and hours of time to try to piece them back together. It was very inefficient. Now, why do these collection issues happen? Um, typically, there's a strong incentive for uh, end corporate clients to use their own in-house IT resources to do a collection. Now, if they're you know, large enough and have the expertise and have the right software, that's absolutely fine. Um, but if they don't, uh, they're not familiar with this, then a forensic expert should be engaged. And, and I should say the incentive for corporates to do their own collections is because it's cheaper. They get to use their already existing staff. Um, but if a collection isn't done properly, the resulting you know, either e-discovery costs from us to try to fix things up, or the legal team's added costs where they have to review lots and lots of duplicates far outweighs you know, the few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars to do a forensic collection. So uh, one of the value adds uh, law firms can add to their, uh, or in-house counsel can add, is they can qualify their in-house IT department um, whether it's appropriate that they do this. So the questions to ask are, can they maintain a proper chain of custody? Really, can they document everything that they're doing? You know, are they using any keywords, date range filters, et cetera? That really needs to be documented. What kind of software are they using to do this collection? Um, depending on the type of collection, they'll want to use some sort of industry software, SDK, NK, et cetera. Um, an important part is, if need be, a member of the IT department should be able to testify in court how they did the collection. You know, typically, we don't see this too often in uh, commercial litigation, but it does happen, uh, and typically, uh, if collection issues do arise and they kind of make their way and are disclosed to the other side, the other side may want to pick apart the collection process. Um, finally, really uh, the output that we want, uh, or before the e-discovery phase, we want all kind of emails uh, loaded into a, a PSP file, which is a container file where you can put you know, 10,000 plus emails into one uh, store. Okay, the next phase after collection, once the you know, physical email has been collected, email electronic documents, 
Then it moves on to the e-discovery processing phase. Um, it's, it's a bad name. We, we call it electronic data discovery, which is just this portion of uh, the overall e-discovery life cycle. Uh, but it's generally referred to as the processing phase, or EDD. So what do we actually do in this phase? Um, the first thing is those PST files, which are nice wrapped up containers of email, we pull everything out of them. We pull all the emails, um, line up their attachments below them. Um, we pull out all the metadata fields, the to's, the from's, the cc's, um, the titles, the dates, etc. We run that deduplication. That removes, typically we see about a 30% reduction uh, in the volume of documents from deduplication. So, you know, often I'll have law firm clients who will ask me, look, you know, why don't we just review this email in Outlook? And, you know, it's going to be cheaper. We don't have to pay you, you know, the one-off cost to process this stuff. And my response is, well, you're going to be reviewing a lot of duplicates. You know, and, and your, the time you spend is enormous. When I say, you know, the cost of, of lawyer time can be quite, you know, quite high. So if I can reduce your time by 30% off uh, the get-go, well, then I think, you know, you can justify that cost saving to your client. Um, we, do, we perform that email threading, and then finally we assign a unique document number, a document ID, to every um, file in the system. So, you know, this is probably the most important thing that we do, is assigning that unique document ID. You know, at, um, when I'm at cocktail parties and people ask me what I do, when I try to explain it, I actually say, you know, part of it is put stamp numbers on documents. That's really Another um, <coughs> service we run quite frequently is near duplicate detection. So this is where um, it's not exact duplicates. Typically, we can remove exact duplicates um, with kind of 100% certainty. So that's fairly standard. But what we do sometimes is we run near duplicate detection. So this is where you have a data set, and there might be lots of uh, versions of documents, and you kind of want to all review all those documents together. Sometimes you also might have, they might be true duplicates, but it's kind of hard to tell. Maybe one is a Word file, another is a paper version of that Word file that's been uh, printed out and then scanned in. We can't um, remove one of them because, we can't remove the paper one because there might have been handwriting, say, on there. But what we can do is we can lump all these suspected duplicates together so that the legal team can at least be reviewing them all in one place. Anyone who's done discovery review before will know you spend a lot of time dealing with duplicates. So we try to add some help uh, on that front with identifying duplicates or, or suspected near duplicates. Okay, let's talk about document review software. Um, this is where you know we've actually um, <clears throat> You know, we've scanned all our hard copy, we've processed all our electronic uh, documents, we've loaded it all into a review system, and then the legal team actually gets to log in, and, and for sometimes, sometimes this is really the first time they're really looking at documents. So let me just launch another poll here. Make sure everyone's still awake, hopefully. My question is, what level of experience do you have with uh, review uh, platforms? So I have a slide in a minute. Those are, in Australia, they're generally Relativity, Delium, and Ringtail are big um, review platforms. So we'll just get an idea of who's actually you know, used one before. Okay, so a healthy number. I've never seen one before. That's great. You'll get an idea today of um, what they're like. And then a few, um, <coughs> a few very experienced. Okay. So why do we need review software? So we're, we, we have, you know, let's say we have 50,000 documents that was, you know, we're hard copy and electronic. We're now ready to um, prepare for discovery and potentially prepare our case as well. So we start, we're faced with some you know, logistical questions. You know, how do we divvy up 50,000 documents between five staff members? What's the most efficient way to divvy them up? How can we control the quality of the review? Um, there might be a statement of claim um, where historically you would take um, uh, different colored 
sticky notes and put them on various documents in the hard copy form. How can we do that, you know, in the, with electronic discovery? Um, and then finally, you know, are all my reviewers understanding what the mat, what the issues in the case are, and, and applying the rules kind of consistently? So we have document review software available uh, to help address these challenges. Uh, and the document review software has specific features um, built into it to kind of address each one of those challenges. So, for example, um, we have batching. Uh, what batching does is you can divvy up documents um, to a team of, say, five reviewers. Uh, and you might want to uh, divvy up the documents. Uh, you might want to run some keyword searches and just assign the results of those keywords off to one particular uh, reviewer. And batching just helps manage that so people aren't running into each other. Um, we also have custom logic rules that we can put into place. Uh, for example, um, there might be a rule that we put in place where if you mark a document privileged, you have to uh, tick which kind of privilege it is, legal professional privilege, et cetera. Um, these kind of rules just make it so that at the end of the review, everything's been filled out properly. Um, if this isn't done, then kind of at the end, you have to do a lot of QA work. We'd rather, uh, we'd rather have that being done during the whole process. We also convert uh, the statement of claim, if there is uh, one present, into a legal issues tree. And then uh, documents are, are tagged against each of the issues. Um, historically, you would use your colored sticky notes. Uh, in this one, you're now just ticking boxes on the side uh, in order to tag against relevant issues. We also get some nice uh, reporting. There, there's complete auditing in the system. So every click that's really made in the system is recorded. Um, because of that, we get some really nice reports uh, that show how staff have been uh, recording documents. And that both gives you some kind of uh, quantitative uh, results. So, you know, uh, Joe coded, you know, 30 documents an hour, et cetera, those kind of uh, reports. But also we get some qualitative reports where, you know, reviewer A, um, he marks 90% uh, of his documents relevant. Reviewer B, he marked 70% uh, of his documents relevant. Let's take a look at the difference. Uh, you know, are they understanding relevance is the same, or are they just looking at kind of different sets? We also have a chronology feature. Uh, many of you may have worked with chronologies in the hard copy world, and that's typically you might have a Word document. You would have uh, your events kind of typed in, and then you reference each of the documents in, a, in the side uh, column, just saying, you know, these documents exist, and they prove the existence of this event. The chronology works a very similar way within the software, except it's all integrated. It's just a separate tab in the software. You, you build out your events, and then you link the underlying documents. Um, so you always have them right there at your fingertips uh, by hyperlink. This is really useful for the next feature, um, and this is giving access uh, to other members of kind of the extended team. Uh, one example would be letting counsel in. Uh, typically, counsel, you don't need to give them access to the whole, uh, all of your documents, because a lot are irrelevant. You only want to give them access to the ones that are you know, going to be used in the case. Um, so often, you might want to give counsel just access to the chronology, say, for example. Um, it just makes it really easy uh, for counsel. Um, the other uh, common group we give access to are expert witnesses. Um, so how this would work is you'd go through, you'd tag a certain field uh, for uh, all these documents go to the expert witness. When the expert witness logs in, he or she only sees those documents uh, that you've kind of released to them. Um, really, by having kind of all the team's efforts uh, in the software itself, uh, the work product is saved within the software. You know, at law firms, there's a lot of turnover of staff on projects, either from staff leaving or from just reassignment of resources and moving staff between cases. So having everything kind of uh, stored within the review system really helps uh, that business continuity. Finally, uh, one of the kind of core features uh, for discovery preparation is you know, you're going through documents, marking them relevant, uh, not relevant. As they're you know, relevant and non-privileged, they're dropping onto the discovery list. So that way, when you're done your, your review, that list is already generated and then can easily be spat out to Excel or PDF format. So just really nice, uh, quick kind of finished product at the end. That part of it is very um, easy. It's, you're, you're doing the work kind of as you're doing your review.
Um, several big players in the market for review software you might have heard of, uh, Relativity, Helium, and Ringtail um, are some of the big players. Fundamentally, they all do the same uh, thing. There's obviously quite a bit of feature differences um, between the products. But at the heart of it, they're there to review documents and prepare um, for uh, ultimately trial. <clears throat> One thing that we spend a fair amount of time on is talking about workflow within a case. So because everything's stored electronically in the system, we're actually able to map out a workflow. So how this works is kind of everything starts at the top in this unreviewed document. Documents move into this first pass review. Your reviewers make the decision, well, is it relevant? If it's not, then the documents kind of disappear from the workflow. They're still in the system and you can access them if need be, but they're no longer kind of part of the general workflow. Um, then, uh, if they are relevant, they pass into this next phase, which is a privilege uh, review. Often this is done at the same time, but this is the logic. They make a call. Is the document privileged? Okay, well, it goes over to the left and works its way down to the privileged list of documents. If it's not privileged, it works its way to the right and ultimately ends up on the list of documents for disclosure. Um, if it's partially privileged, maybe it, it drops into this special uh, view where redaction needs to be drawn, and then it can move on to the list for, di for disclosure. So this is a really standard workflow that actually is our template. Um, we have, we can develop really sophisticated workflows depending on uh, the case requirement. <clears throat> I've included just a couple of screenshots to show you what document review software looks like. Uh, if you actually start in an e-discovery, you're going to be living and breathing um, this software. And it's basically, um, on the left, <clears throat> you have, this is uh, electronic discovery from the Enron matter, all the executives at Enron, <clears throat> excuse me, their emails uh, over here on the left. The, the actual emails and documents <clears throat> are over here on the right. And you can see the fields of information. So there's date, there's the, the author, the twos, the titles, and then the re, you know the relevance call that the team has made. <clears throat> if you're actually looking at a document, um, this is actually what it looks like uh, on the screen. So any of our keyword hits have been highlighted on the left. Our issues tree, which maybe we got from our statement of claim, is that tick box over here on the right, and then. Uh, in the bottom left, we have um, uh, the family information, so hosts and attachments. This can also be where you see uh, near duplicate information um, as well. Okay, um, so after the review phase, you have your uh, relevant documents, uh, you've disclosed to all the parties, the matter isn't settling, well, it's, uh, look, it looks like it's moving towards trial. So now in, in cases where there's lots of uh, documents, um, often an electronic courtroom is ordered uh, by the judge. Now, there are guidelines on how to actually use uh, documents electronically in the courtroom. Um, what are they exactly? Well, it's a combination of hardware, software, and services, really just to allow presentation of documents electronically. So there's kind of two main ways it comes about. Either the parties are comfortable with uh, electronic trials and they agree to use one uh, themselves, or the court, is the judge, um, wants to use it and uh, he or she orders uh, the use of uh, electronic trial. What's involved in it from a requirement side? Uh, it does depend. Some of the more of the modern courtrooms will have a lot of infrastructure built into the courtrooms, um, but Ultimately, it's going to require uh, a lot of infrastructure in terms of uh, it could require a server in the courtroom, uh, lots of video screens, a uh, database to actually run all the documents. Uh, there could be video conferencing, uh, et cetera. Here I have uh, a photo of what it actually looks like in the court. If you ever have a chance to actually go and uh, look at one of these, it's uh, pretty impressive. <clears throat> There's just screens all over the place. Basically, when it's actually in process, the barrister is up you know, near the witness stand, yells out a document ID, calls out a document ID, and there's an operator who punches that into the program, and then that document gets published to the courtroom. Okay. 
Now, I want to take, um, probably have another 10 minutes before we go to Q&A. I want to talk about new developments in e-discovery. So e-discovery has been around for hmm, probably 15 to 20 years, really since electronic documents and email became prevalent. Um, and, and keyword searching has been around since then as well um, for, for uh, litigation uh, review. And there hasn't been a lot of changes to the industry, uh, fundamentally how it operates. What's on the horizon, and we're seeing a lot of this use in the US and the UK, is something called analytics or predictive coding. Now, there's a lot of different names for this technology. There's analytics, concept searching, predictive coding, technology-assisted review, computer-assisted review, and clustering. Uh, this is because there's a lot of different vendors, software vendors out there, and they each call it kind of something a little bit different. Uh, but fundamentally, it's, it's all the same. Um, I might just launch, before I tell you all about it, I might just launch another poll to see who's actually heard of this, um, from the analytics or predictive coding in the e-discovery space. So let's launch this poll. So has anyone heard of this predictive coding analytics? Uh, and if you have, um, kind of what level? Um, have you actually used before? Okay, so a healthy chunk haven't heard of it, which is not surprising if you haven't used a review system before. Um, and then a few have, 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 I guess, heard about it, um, and then a few have actually used it, which is great. <clears throat> okay, so what actually is predictive coding and analytics? So a traditional traditional keyword searching, it's just like back in the days of encyclopedias where you have a you have a, you know a paper book and in the back there's an index. And in the index it lists every word that's used in the book and which page it can be found on. That's really how keyword searching works. Literally, if the word that you search for is there, it'll come back in all documents where it exists. Now, what the analytics engine does is it builds an index, but it <clears throat> It actually tries to figure out when words are related to each other. I'll give you an example. If we have a document set and we have a document talking about a pet dog and a document talking about a pet cat, it's going to realize that dogs and cats are conceptually related. So that way, when you actually search for the word dog, things about cats will come back as well because we've learned that they're both pets and drawn that way. Now, why would we actually go through this process um, really, what what it um, what the example I like to use is uh, when you're doing one of your Google searches now. You know, if you remember 20 years ago, you type in some words in Google, or 15 years ago, and it would come back with tons and tons of web pages, and you'd have to like click through maybe to the you know third, fourth, fifth, sixth page to find what you're looking for. Now, if you notice, you type in three words into Google. And somehow it magically finds you the website that you're looking for, you know, in the top few hits. And how it's doing that is it's no longer bringing back every website that has, you know, the three words that you've typed in. It's using algorithms behind the scenes to figure out, to uh, take a guess really at what you're looking for, and they're presenting that to you. But anal analytics is a very similar process. It's using different algorithms than Google, but the concept is the same. We're using advanced algorithms behind the scenes to try to find you the documents you want rather than every document where that word is there. <clears throat> now, to measure how effective um, this analytics is, I need to teach you two terms from library science, which, is, which are recall and precision. So <clears throat> this has to do with anything, uh, any sort of searching, any sort of document review. There's two things that we want to be looking at. Recall, which is what percentage of relevant documents are we actually missing? But remember, as soon as we enter the world of using keyword searches, we're, we're, we're excluding documents from our review because they didn't come up in our keyword hit. Once you start down that road, you're going to be missing relevant documents. And I know that's it's kind of the, the dirty secret in, in e-discovery or in, in litigation, um, but uh, really, the concept of, 
of proportionality, which protects you from having to review uh, every single document because there's simply too many, it's too expensive. We have to use something like keyword searching. So we're going to be missing relevant documents. How many? Hopefully as few as possible. That's what recall measures. Precision measures uh, what percent of the kind of results that we're going to review, how many are actually irrelevant in there? How much time are we wasting reviewing the relevant documents? Ideally, we want high recall. We're not missing many relevant documents. And high precision. We're not uh, wasting time reviewing relevant documents. So how does actually assisted review analytics work? Uh, effectively, we train the system the concept of relevant and non-relevant documents. So how that works is uh, we'd set up a, a set of like maybe a thousand random documents. Uh, uh, a senior reviewer would review those thousand and tag them relevant, not relevant, etc. And from that, uh, the system uses algorithms to then kind of take a guess at the rest of the, the universe of documents to figure out if they're relevant or not. And it's an iterative process where we have to train the system, probably with several thousand documents, um, and it actually reports back how confident it is uh, of, its, of, of its prediction. Ideally, you, you keep training the system until we get that high recall, you know, 80% and above is kind of an industry standard um, for high levels of recall. Now, how effective is that compared to, say, uh, you know, manual review or keyword searching? Well, what we've found and what studies show is you can use really narrow keywords to only bring back a small set of documents, but that can have recall as low as 20%, meaning you're missing most of your relevant documents. You can use really broad keywords, which will probably catch uh, all of your relevant documents or a large, large portion of them, but you're then missing, uh, well, then you're bringing in lots of junk with that, and you're going, your precision is going to be very low. You're going to be spending a lot of time and ultimately your client's money reviewing irrelevant documents. You could say, all right, well, let's just put junior reviewers on all of this, and we'll just plow through it. What we've found in studies we've run is if you give reviewers a large chunk of non-relevant documents, they'll start to suffer from document fatigue, and they'll start missing relevant documents. Uh, in one case study we ran, they missed one out of every two relevant documents, even when it was right in front of them. So the promise of analytics is we can actually achieve uh, high recall and precision rates of you know, 75 to 80%, which means that we're not missing uh, any relevant documents, we're very few, and we're not wasting tons of time reviewing uh, irrelevant documents. Um, finally, uh, I'll just mention a, a kind of a, a history of how e-discovery services were performed. Um, e-discovery providers um, have been around as, well, there's two ways the services have been done. Either as e-discovery providers, like an outsource model uh, like eLaw, or um, some of the larger firms have had in-house teams um, that run these services. Um, historically, Really, there wasn't much of an option for kind of small to mid-sized firms. Um, really, the big firms, you needed to spend, you know, a million dollars plus to set up all the software and services and staff involved to run one of these systems. Um, probably in the last five years, uh, we started offering relativity about that uh, four years ago. Um, we now offer the ability for firms, small to mid-sized firms, to rent the software from us. So it's kind of given, you know, the a small firm an ability to run large cases using the software by effectively using software as a service. We've also seen um, the, the kind of big firms, the top 10, historically they used to do everything in-house. There's been a lot of client pressure to reduce those costs. So now some of those firms, they do some of the work in-house and then they outsource some of that work to a service provider uh, like ELOF. Okay. Um, I think that's my final slide. So I'll open it up to um, questions. Uh, if you want to just type your questions uh, in the text box below, uh, I'll be happy to address them. <laughs> Any 
questions out there, please don't be shy. The simple questions are fine, advanced questions are great, whatever you have. Oh, Pamela Kuhn. A few people typing there. People are typing, so the questions are coming. In. Um, okay, the first question: Does the Supreme Court of Victoria have a practice note that applies uh, to e-litigation? Um, yes, there is. Um, I think I had it in one of my first slides. Uh, the slides will be available um, after this presentation, so it lists um, what the, the practice note for um, the tutorial is. So, we're, so I think we'll, we're sending out the slides tomorrow, so I actually have that uh, in there, so you can uh, look that up from that information. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, from Matthew H. Have there been any Australian cases approving the use of predictive coding? Um, so, no, basically. There haven't been any judicial um, review on, or any judicial weigh in in Australia um, that I'm aware of yet, um, uh, saying, you know, use this software, don't use this software. Um, there's been several out of the US. Um, but there's been some pretty glowing endorsements. We actually ran um, <clears throat> a, uh, a round table back in June where we had um, Judge Peck um, from the Southern District of New York, who's actually the judge who wrote this. I glowingly endorsed this software. Um, and one of the, um, we had a <clears throat> New South Wales justice who said, you know, bring me the case. I will prove it. Um, it just hasn't been brought uh, before her before. So, you know, we know we're, we're using some of this software. Um, it hasn't really been um, challenged yet uh, or um, been brought before the judge, um, before the justice for kind of re review. Um, but, you know, we're, we're kind of waiting for that landmark case, and I think, you know, when that happens, um, there will be further evidence that we should be using it. You know, in the meantime, I should say that it's not... <clears throat> You know, when we went down that keywords road, we, we entered a whole new world of we're not reviewing every document. And really what analytics is trying to do is a better way to do keyword, keyword searching. The same way Google now is smarter about the way it does, you know, it takes your keywords you feed into it. Um, analytics is trying to do the same thing. Okay, so next question. Um, in a case before court, does ELA have the ability to allow multiple screens and the use of software such as MS Excel uh, to filter Excel files to show data to the court? For instance, if you have an Excel file, you only want to show a subset of the data to the court. Um, I guess I'm not entirely sure what the question is. Let me think about that. If you're... Um, if you're meaning, um, uh, well, the first, let me answer the first part, which I know the answer. Um, okay, okay, thank you. So the first part is, can we have multiple screens? Um, <clears throat> basically, um, yes. Um, how some of the software works is uh, in the courtroom, there's kind of the, the private screens and then a public screen. So you could publish documents just to the judge or rather share documents just with the judge, just with certain counsel, um, and then publish it to the audience. So there is the ability to do multiple screens. Um, can you show just kind of a subset of a document? 
Um, probably have to come back to you on that. My thought would be if you just want to show part of a document, um, you might need to produce it as a separate document rather than kind of filtering it on the fly. Um, just for the record, um, if you're producing you know, a filtered down version of Excel um, for the public record, you probably need to produce that maybe as a report to the PDF or something like that. Um, but I might have to come back to you, Vernon, to find out exactly how it's done on the back. Uh, but good question. Um, okay, next question um, from Pamela. Um, CM6 provides the expert reports and witness statements should be hyperlinked to the relevant source document. Do you know of any time when that has failed? And if yes, how did it fail and how was it fixed? Um, okay, let's see here. I guess, I mean, I guess I can say that often, um, yes, you know, Hyperlinks are, are part of, these hyperlink reports are um, a standard part of kind of what we do um, in the process, which is you, know, you get these nice reports and then all the documents are hyperlinked. Um, I, I'm not sure offhand um, about how it was failed. Uh, maybe, do you, do you mean like a, was there a technical failure or um, was, uh, Maybe you could elaborate a bit on that. Um, I'll, I'll admit my experience usually isn't as much in the kind of court end of it, so maybe um, during court, uh, I'm not sure. There probably was some time when the technology failed, but I'm not as familiar with it. Okay, yeah, so in court, maybe if something isn't happening um, correctly. Well, you know, look, the reality is um, sometimes there are backups with uh, there might be a hard copy bundle um, <clears throat> in the courtroom. So say there is maybe some failure with the technology or, you know, it can't be rectified quickly, which I think typically it can be. Um, although I have seen, you know, a case where uh, something might go down and then they break for five minutes and then back up again. Um, but sometimes you get counsel, that's right, it's a good point, Pamela, who's not um, technically adept uh, and some sort of hard copy is still used or referred to as a backup. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that there. Any other questions in the last few um, minutes here? Okay. Um, well, we'll. Um, I don't see any more typing, so. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, hopefully it was helpful. And I think by tomorrow we're going to send around uh, the actual slides involved um, for you uh, to be able to refer to. And we should have um, a video as well um, in case uh, you want to forward this on uh, to any other colleagues. Okay. Um, thank you very much for joining us today.